All right, hello everyone. We are glad that you were able to join us today and um, we do expect more people to be jumping in and out of the Zoom here. Um, this is pretty casual. We do have a presentation for you today. And, um, but feel free to interrupt uh, if you've got some questions. Um, you can put it through the chat uh, or you can do the raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, and we will have some time at the end too for questions as well. Um, but today's, today's talk is really about just how a prosthesis is made. So it gives the background of what we do uh, as North Icon Prosthetic Company um, and how we come up with a prosthesis for your patients. Uh, and what we do here to be able to physically make that and provide that final device um, for them. So without further ado, we'll just jump right on in. So today's content will be three main things. First, we'll just talk generally about prosthetic design because each prosthesis is unique to the individual. So this is not, we do not have a shelf of prostheses that we pull one off for a patient. Everyone is specifically and custom made for that individual. We'll also be able to give you a timeline to expect for a uh, general prosthetic timeline for, for provision of the prosthesis, as well as be able to give you an insider look at the fabrication process. So as we said, no two are the same, no two prostheses are the same. And patient evaluation is really the key here. So if we think about our spectrum of needs. We have lots of different people who have had amputations for various reasons. Um, and you can think about some people are gonna need more stability. Some people are gonna need more mobility or energy return. And we designed that specific prosthesis for the individual. There are hundreds of feet on the market, hundreds of knees on the market. There are various ways to custom make the socket or to choose what interface would be appropriate for the for that particular person. And it really is dependent on that individual, the final design and product that we, that we produce. So where do you start with something like this? If it's such a huge spectrum, where we like to start is we like to start by first narrowing it down into to major groups. So thinking about the kind of like mobility um, in terms of general categories. Now, Medicare has made that easier for us in terms of functional level classification. So they have what's called a K level and most insurances also follow the same guidelines. And the K level is that you rank from K0 to K4. And this is based on the individual's current or anticipated potential ambulation with the prosthesis. So we'll go through each of the K levels to give you a basic understanding of what they mean. And so our K-zeros are our bed or wheelchair bound. These are people who would not benefit from a prosthesis for ambulation purposes. And in fact, it, a prosthesis would probably get in the way of their ability to maneuver around either their home or the community. Um, so there, it, for the K-zeros, there is no medical necessity for a prosthesis. Um, and so we would not be creating a prosthesis for these particular individuals. Now, just because you start as a K0 in some cases doesn't mean you're always gonna be a K0. It may be, it's too early to be able to be uh, truly a prosthetic candidate. And maybe with some physical therapy, they'll be able to get to a point where they could be a K1 ambulator. So our K1s are gonna be our household ambulators. This can vary anywhere from using the prosthesis for transfers to get from the bed to the wheelchair, uh, the wheelchair to standing at the sink, uh, maybe doing a little bit of ambulation in the home to doing even more ambulation in the home, just walking around every day in the house. Um, usually this level is using some sort of assistive device like a walker, um, potentially a cane. Um, but basically most, the primary uh, ambulation is in the household. Um, and they do very little community ambulation. The next level is the K2, and this is our limited community ambulator. These are people who do get out in the community and use their pre prosthesis to ambulate. Um, they may also still be using a walker or a cane, or they might not be using an assistive device. Uh, they can do stairs, ramps, and curbs. Um, but generally they walk at a single speed. So it's your slow pace walkers. They're not gonna be moving fast. They're just gonna be going at their self-selected cadence. 
And, um, but they have the ability to get in and out of the car, to maybe run some errands, to go to their doctor's appointments, to get to physical therapy, um, but have, but have a limitation to that. They are not going to be out all day in the community. Our next level is the K3s. These are our unlimited community ambulators. These are people who walk at various speeds. Um, they may use an assistive device uh, occasionally, but generally speaking, they're gonna be people who have enough stability not to use it. Sometimes they'll use it for, for offloading or for pain reduction or just it, or maybe just general stability, um, especially on some uneven terrain. Uh, but in general, they're out, they're able to change their cadence, they can walk slow, they can walk fast, they can they catch a bus, they can, you know, walk around with their children, play with their kids, um, but are doing it on a very consistent basis, a daily basis, they are out and about and moving around because of vocational or um, therapeutic um, or uh, recreational needs. And then lastly are our K4s. These are our high impact individuals. They are children running around. They're active adults um, who kind of go above and beyond just general community ambulation or are high-end athletes. Um, so as you can imagine, these would have very different needs than um, our lower level um, K, uh, lower K level patients. So as we design a prosthesis, we're taking into account a lot of different considerations. One is their daily activities. What are they doing? Is it just the transfers or are they out running marathons? What are their hobbies? What kind of exercise needs do they have? Are they currently in physical therapy right now? Do they have plans to go? Um, what kind of, of therapeutic needs is that? Uh, what kind of comorbidities do they have? So Maybe they're on dialysis three days a week and we need to take that into consideration um, because of their end-stage renal disease. What's their hand dexterity like? So do they have difficulty with being able to don some kind, some of the prosthetic types that we have in terms of interfaces or the, or the entire prosthesis? And going along with that, their level of independence. Um, so if they do have hard time with their hands, maybe they have someone who can help them at home or are they reliant solely on their own independence and ability to be able to put on and take off the prosthesis themselves? What's their cognitive ability like? Uh, that can come into play if we're starting to talk about much more complicated devices. So ones that have microprocessors or require um, considerable amount of maintenance and would need to be able to follow through um, with being able to do that and, and manage that on their own um, or with assistance. The technology, technological savviness. So again, if, if there's someone who doesn't like plugging in their cell phone every night, they might not be someone that would be a great candidate for a microprocessor need that would need to be charged every night. So again, kind of what is their gadget tolerance in terms of what they'd be willing to take on and uh, accept as part of the responsibility of using a prosthesis? What's their pain level? That might indicate too what kind of prosthesis that we need to provide, or at least in terms of socket interface, um, and design for that. Uh, we, we often are very concerned about their past use of, pros, of, of prosthesis in terms of what has worked well for them, what hasn't worked, what are their goals, and maybe how have things changed, um, and how can we help design something next that even better fits their current status, and what are those current limitations that they have and the goals that they've set for themselves. So all these things come together uh, to be able to make that specific prosthesis for the individual. And that just goes into the initial design. So in terms of a fitting timeline, I want to run through a general timeline. Now, it's certainly going to vary by the individual, and these are just general guidelines. Healing times are going to vary. Um, insurance authorizations may take longer or shorter, uh, but in general, this will give you an idea of what kind of timeline are we talking about and what kind of different prostheses are appropriate during these timelines? So we've got four different types of prostheses that I want to discuss in this segment. The first is an immediate post-operative prosthesis. So this is something that would occur within 24 hours of actually having the amputation. So this, it, it 
it is immediate. It's often put on in the operating room. Um, you will see uh, it's done with as a cast, a plaster cast of the patient's limb. There are some excellent benefits with this, uh, and this would be done with the surgeon's approval, um, but in, in coordination with the operation. One of the benefits that uh, the literature has shown is that there is a psychological benefit to waking up from surgery and having a prosthetic limb on as well. So you, you have that benefit of seeing both legs still there. Um, the actual wrapping of the cast around the limb helps to contain some of the post-operative um, post swelling of the limb, which can help promote healing. Um, for our transtibial patients are below the knee, you also are casting them into knee extension, which we know is important post-operatively to make sure that they maintain full range of motion um, into extension at the knee and uh, with flexion contractures being the risk here. The disadvantages of this are that one, it can be pretty heavy. Um, two, because it is a cast and it goes up above the knee, it restricts knee motion. So they're not able to flex their knee, which can make it difficult for getting in and out of bed, um, especially depending on the patient's tolerance for that. They, uh, a, a third uh, contra, sort of contraindication or um, drawback from this would be that because it's wrapped in a cast, you also don't get the benefit of being able to see the wound, the, the incision line. So it's often not done for our dysvascular patients. This is something that we've personally done at Dykemeyer for more of our um, cancer patients or uh, other types of patients where we know that wound healing is not going to be as much of an issue. Um, and again, done in conjunction with the surgeon who is, who is authorizing this. Usually these last for about a week, the actual casts. Um, after that, the limb has reduced down in size, the cast becomes essentially too big uh, and starts to get really heavy. Uh, and often patients at that point are they're just done with having this on. Um, they're ready to get it off. They're ready to move their, their knee around, uh, move their limb around. And, uh, and often psychologically too are interested in seeing the, the residual limb and, and the physicians are able to check it out, check the wound site. So that's the short term. Another option for early fitting is um, initial or early post-operative. So this is done while the limb is still healing. Um, we don't see a lot of this in practice, uh, but it is still an option. And again, it would really depend on the surgeon's uh, comfort level with that particular wound site and, uh, and healing ability. Um, but there are prefabricated um, plastic sockets that can be used that are adjustable, uh, like the ones you see on the right-hand side of the screen, that can be used to uh, create this adjustable fit um, for early use. The, it can also be done with a plaster cast, but one that's removable, um, like the picture, like the lower picture. For both of these, it's not going to be full weight bearing. So, uh, which I, actually I didn't mention on the last slide, but the immediate post-operative is also not full weight bearing. It is light touch. It's like 10 pounds of pressure. So same thing with these, you're not gonna be doing full, full weight bearing. Usually you're gonna be using it with a walker or crutches to be able to offload because you still have a healing incision. And the most important thing during this stage is to maintain the healing uh, of the, the incision line so that they can long-term progress to um, full prosthesis use. Um, but there are some indications why you may wanna get some initial weight bearing through the prosthesis. Um, and that's when an early fitting would be a what we see more of is going into their first prosthesis as a preparatory prosthesis. So this is done once the incision line is fully healed, the surgeon has given them clearance to be able to start the prosthetic process. And um, they've been evaluated for the prosthesis, the full prescription has been determined, uh, and we start the casting and fabrication process, which you, you will see later in this presentation. But with this, the um, the preparatory prosthesis can be uh, completed as early as eight weeks, usually by the three month period is when they actually get their first prosthesis. So sometime between that two and two and three months from the time of their amputation to the time they get that preparatory prosthesis is fairly typical, uh, but they use it for about six months. 
And during this time, the residual limb is going to be shaping up even more. They're going to be reducing in size of the limb because of reduction in swelling from the surgery. That's all getting pumped out. Um, the, the, there's going to be some initial atrophy of the muscles because the calf muscle isn't attached to the same as it was before. So that's going to get smaller. Um, and in general, it's a good starter prosthesis. I like to think of it as a training prosthesis um, where you just someone's able to get up and start, start that process, start learning to walk again, start learning to transfer again, really being able to learn the basics, start from scratch, start with more stable components and get moving and seeing some real progress. Um, after that about six month mark, again, it really depends on the individual. It can be anywhere from four months to about eight months. Um, but what we do is, um, at that point, it would be a, um, sorry, at that point, we would be doing, uh, going to the definitive prosthesis. So, so at about the six-month mark, we're looking at a lot of different options. We've got all, all of the, all of the variables here um, in terms of knees, feet, uh, sockets, components, whereas the preparatory, we, we want to keep pretty simple. Here's where we really start to add the bells and the whistles. And so I want to take you through that kind of custom fabrication process um, for as we design it. So how do we build this prosthesis? Again, we've got so many different options. That we've started out, we've narrowed it down um, with the timeline. Uh, we, have an, we have a sense of the timeline. We've narrowed down the, the design. How do we make it? So this is, this is your inside into Dankmeyer part. Um, and so I want to talk specifically, we'll start with, we're just going to talk about transtibial today. So our below the knee prostheses. Uh, it does get more complicated if we start adding knees, hips, um, or if we start to talk upper extremity. But for today, we're going to be looking at how do we build a transtibial prosthesis. So there's three main sections for the transtibial prosthesis. One is the socket, which would include the interface and any sort of suspension. Two is the pylons and the adapters, and three would be the foot. So we'll start with that socket. Now, traditional socket fabrication starts with a plaster cast. So what we do is we take measurements of the residual limb. We will, we will mark it up with an indelible pencil, be able to mark all those bony areas that you see in blue on the limb and then to actually take a cast of the limb with plaster. Wrap it up, let it harden, and then take it off of the patient. From there, the cast is then poured. And um, what we do is we take a liquid plaster and literally pour it into the um, negative model of the limb that we had so that we can then strip that model um, and have a positive model of the residual limb. And from there, the cast is then modified. So that positive model that we had, we had all the marks on there, we have all the measurements, so we confirm our measurements. We take it down in certain areas that we wanna increase pressure. We also build up areas that we want to um, relieve pressure. And then as an alternative, so that's traditional, the initial traditional uh, start of the fabrication. We also have the option for scanning. So with technological advances of um, scanners and 3D printing, uh, we have the ability to scan the residual limb with a scanner attached to our iPad um, or a handheld scanner. Um, and you can see like that this is contactless type of um, impression taking, um, but then we can do digital modifications. So through our CAD CAM system, we can create those same reliefs, those same reductions, uh, same added, pressure areas, um, but from a digital record. From there, the initial stage for fabrication is a test socket. So this is a clear plastic socket that gets pulled over the modified model and gets cut out and gets shaped up. And then we will actually test that on the patient. So in order to get it ready, it's cut out. And then that plaster gets drilled out as well. 
So we have a nice test socket for then fitting purposes. So we'll put the test socket on the patient. We'll make adjustments. Often we'll do a heat adjustment. Um, with that, you can, we can use a heat gun or a torch um, to be able to create relief. Sometimes we'll also be adding padding, marking up for trimming it in different locations. And we have the patient walk with it. So we can actually see through, we use that clear plastic so we can see through the, the socket to say, okay, well, I see some pressure areas here. I see the blanching of the skin or, or, um, or the, the tension on the sock is too high in this area. Let me create some relief, whether or not the patient can feel that. They will also give us feedback subjectively on that to see if um, that, so that we can make adjustments further to the socket itself. Um, and then we'll do some alignment adjustments too. So we're able to tweak the screws on the prosthesis to create different angles, um, to slide the socket forward or backwards, angle it um, medial or laterally, and be able to just change the way that the patient's walking because of the way that the socket is over the foot. So once we have a test socket made, we will then go to, and we've got it um, the way we want it, for the patient, we will go to a definitive socket fabrication. So this is this example here is a lamination in pro progress. This is typically how we will create an acrylic socket. Um, we put layers of nylon and carbon fiber, um, and then we use an, um, an acrylic resin that starts out as a liquid. It gets um, it gets strung through the various layers to fully saturate it, and then it'll harden, it'll cure. Um, and once it's hardened, we'll be able to break it out in a similar process that we did to the test socket um, and be able to create the final product, um, such as an example of the one on the picture on the right-hand side, which has a combination of both a plastic inner piece um, that's more flexible and the rigid outer shell. So again, just one example of how a prosthesis, um, prosthetic socket may look. And then we pick the right pylons and adapters to be able to assemble it to the correct height. So we match the patient's contralateral side. And then there's feet. So this lecture is, uh, the, the idea of picking a foot is beyond the scope of this particular lecture. Um, but again, there are so many different feet on the market, anywhere from more stability um, to high uh, level energy return um, can be found uh, in the various feet on the market. And then we go back to the assembly. So we have the socket, we attach it to the pylons and adapters, and we attach it to the foot. And we can also do things like put a cover over it um, so that you don't see those internal components. Uh, and it looks a little bit more like the cover and like a skin over it. So it looks more like their contralateral side. Uh, and finally, using the prosthesis. This is, this is what we do this all for, right? So we want somebody to be able to have a device that they're gonna use in whatever way that they deem uh, appropriate for their life. Um, and we just love to see the videos and, uh, and hear the stories about how this has changed uh, their ability to, to walk, run, uh, and get back to their activities that they really wanted to do. So thank you for your attention. Um, any questions? We've got a question from inside the room. Yes. Is the selection of a foot, <clears throat> excuse me, related to K level at all? Yes. So the question is, is the selection of a foot related to K level? And absolutely, yes. So there are various feet that, um, one, if you think about just in general, what insurance will pay for, um, they will want, to, they have categories of different types of feet that they will pay for based on the K level. Um, but even more so functionally, a running foot would not be appropriate to put on someone who's just going to be using the prosthesis for transfers or around the house. So those kind of feet would be deemed a higher K level than um, something that's just more stable. So having that K level selection does really help in the selection process of a foot because we already know what kinds of feet are most appropriate for that particular K level. Great question. Any other questions, or you can feel free to put it through the chat or um, or unmute. Oh, 
All right. Well, we really appreciate your attendance today. Um, we have recorded this session, so we, this will also go up um, for anyone who does want to be able to watch a replay of this. Um, but thank you for coming. And our next one will be uh, next second Thursday of the month, uh, which will be January 13th. Um, and we hope to see you then. We actually do have a question. Thank you. Oh, yeah. question. Oh, perfect. Yes, thank you. Uh, Evelyn asks, how does a prosthetic fitting differ for a person with a chronic amputation versus an acute amputation? Great question. So how does a prosthesis differ for some, and I'll put this on here so you can see it. How does a prosthetic fitting differ for a person with a chronic amputation versus an acute amputation? Thank you, Evelyn. Um, so it really goes back to the idea of one, what is their timeline that we're looking at? Is this some, is, if it's their, really their first prosthesis, we do want to start with something on the more simple side. Um, get them up, get them to hit those basic initial goals of uh, standing, transferring, uh, beginning ambulation. Uh, for someone with a chronic amputation, we'll want to think about um, what has worked for them before. Um, if they haven't had a prosthesis, but they've had a, an amputation for a long time, again, maybe even thinking of starting them out as someone, as you would with someone with an acute amputation, use that training prosthesis, that initial preparatory prosthesis to be able to work out some of these, um, some of these questions you might have about working with them. Um, so in, in general, starting somebody out with acute, we start, we tend to start more simple. If they've had a chronic amputation and they've been a prosthetic user, we can go off of what they've done before, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and make uh, informed decisions going forward with that. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Thank you. And Evelyn, specifically to you, um, if you have any questions about someone in particular and you want to talk through a particular patient case, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I know you have my email. Um, anyone can also uh, send a, an email to info at dankmeyer.com and um, we will be able to take your questions and be able to reach out to you specifically if you have someone in mind that you want to discuss through. Because yeah, this, this is more of a generic talk um, and talking about it with a specific person in mind uh, often is a little bit more insightful. Well, I'll hang on for a little bit more, um, but that is the end of the presentation for today. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Cheryl. She's got our people left, so.